Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today at this annual meeting for the National Academy of Sciences. My name is Kei Koizumi, and I have the honor of serving as the Chief of Staff and the Acting Director for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, or OSTP. I'd like to thank uh, the NAS President, Dr. Marsha McNutt, for organizing this panel and for participating in it and inviting me to moderate for you today. Uh, this session is bringing together science leaders from the Biden-Harris administration, and we want to use this opportunity to highlight the central role that science plays in the Biden-Harris administration and to give you a preview of some of the exciting priorities federal science agencies are prepared to move forward with in this administration. It should be crystal clear that science is here and will guide the administration's actions and policies for the American pe people. In this administration, we value science, we respect it, we use it to benefit the American people. And our priority is to make sure that opportunities to do science and to benefit from science are shared by all Americans. It's my great privilege to introduce the panelists for this session. I will introduce each leader before they give brief remarks. Uh, each of our leaders will be giving remarks for about 10 minutes or so, and you will have the opportunity to ask uh, individual panelists and also the group uh, questions through the question and answer function on the web page. Uh, after each speaker, we'll have the opportunity to take one or two questions for that leader, and then the remaining questions will be part of our group discussions. So. Um, we would like to turn right away to our first panelist, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sathurman Panchanathan, or Panch, as he's known universally. Uh, the Honorable Sathurman Panchanathan is a computer scientist, an engineer, and the 15th director of the U.S. National Science Foundation. Panch was nominated to this position by the president in 2019, and subsequently was unanimously confirmed by the U.S. Senate in 2020. NSF, as most of you know, is an eight and a half billion dollar a year independent federal science agency and the only government agency charged with advancing all fields of scientific discovery, technological innovation and STEM education. Panch previously served as the executive vice president of the Arizona State University Knowledge Enterprise, where he was also chief research and innovation officer. Prior to joining NSF, uh, Panch has an extensive record of public service, including service on the National Science Board. Without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce to you the director of the National Science Foundation, Panch. Thank you very much, Kate. This is truly a delight to be with all of you. Uh, Ma Marsha, thank you so much for the kind invitation to be with uh, this esteemed panel, Francis Collins, Ellen Stofan, Kay, and yourself. I mean, this is truly a privilege to be with all of you this morning. So I'm just going to share my slide, if that's okay with you, and then I will uh, start my remarks. Um, so let's um, make sure I get that up. And if you're all able to see it, please confirm that. Are you all able to see that? Yes. Thank you so much. So again, uh, it's truly a delight to join you today to talk about the future of discovery and innovation. As we all know that this is going to be a very bright future full of opportunities across the entire science and engineering enterprise. Now, clearly the National Academy of Sciences is a critical partner in how it will be unleashed and realized. Right off the bat, I want to say that this is indeed a great moment for science, engineering and technology. The president's budget proposal for FY 2022 and the emphasis on science, I can tell you it's truly exciting, as well as the strong support for the Endless Frontier Act. You can see from the slide here that there is total alignment in terms of the NSF vision, the central column that you see there on the slide, the National Science Board 2030 vision that you see on the left-hand column, and the priorities of the Biden-Harris administration. There is almost a one-to-one -one correspondence between all of this. And that's what makes us feel very confident that we will be unleashing the prosperity through science, engineering, and technology 
into the future. And there is absolutely no question about that. This is a defining moment for several reasons. First of all, we all know that this COVID challenge that is before us, the pandemic, while it is a huge challenge, it has also shown us that science, engineering, and technology can help lead the way, can help find solutions, can find accelerated path for addressing the pandemic at hand and potentially recover from it in an accelerated way. But then we are also in a time of intense global competition. I always say global competition has always been that motivates us, inspires us, and guides us to make sure that we are doing even better than we have ever been, even more excellent than we can ever be. And so this moment of global competition is precisely doing that to us in terms of making us be even more excellent at speed and scale. At the same time as we are talking about the global competition, there is also the immense opportunity that is in front of us. That is what I call as missing millions of talent. That is the talent that is across the broad socioeconomic spectrum and the geographic diversity of our great nation. And last but not the least, we find that there is a bipartisan support for the fact that science, engineering, and technology can help our nation lead the way, leapfrog ahead of competition, as well as unleash the prosperity in our nation by bringing talent, as I said, across our great nation to come and be inspired and therefore express the talent. So we can accomplish a lot through all of this. My vision for NSF since coming has been how might we build on the strong seven decades of amazing progress that we have made through NSF and how might we build on that history and legacy. And in doing so, I identified three major pillars. The first pillar is what I call advancing the frontiers of research into the future. This has been the heart of NSF's mission for the last seven decades and will continue to move forward that way. The only thing I keep repeating is that we will strengthen at speed and scale because the nation demands it, requires it, and the globe is waiting for that kind of a leadership from all of us. At the same time, the central pillar of my vision is how do we ensure accessibility and inclusivity in all aspects of STEM and beyond. So we need to make sure that we're able to scale up existing pathways into STEM fields for all talented folks across the nation into science and engineering. And we have to do it very, very quickly. And the third pillar is what I call securing global leadership. By that, I don't mean that one is a leader and other are followers. What I mean by that is that we are going to lead by our values, our scientific values, and that fellow leaders who will join us, who share our values, share our, our aspirations, our trust, our openness, our transparency, and reciprocity, all of that that we need in order to build a strong coalition of partners that can advance this mission of global leadership. But the foundation of all of these pillars is partnerships, partnerships of every form, of every type, of every kind. And that's why I'm so thrilled to be with the partners that we have even right across in this panel. And more is what is needed in order for us to be able to unleash this prosperity that we are talking about. And in doing so, we have to have, to have this mindset of innovation that permeates everything that we do inside NSF and therefore what we can unleash across the nation. And so when I talk about this, the next slide that I would like to share in the last slide is the following. I've been thinking about this since coming to NSF. NSF's DNA is this tremendous symbiosis and synergy between what I call curiosity-driven, discovery-based, explorations, highly synergized with use-inspired solutions-focused translations. These are highly symbiotic and highly synergistic, as I said. I can share a few examples for you to demonstrate that, 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 that some, the symbiotic and synergistic nature of this solutions-focused as well as use-inspired with curiosity-driven and discovery-based. For example, LIGO. LIGO has been a quest for over 40 years or more for decades or more. For example, in the 70s, the research to prove the existence of gravitational waves was an aspiration. In 90s, the detectors were developed. In 2015, we had the detection of the gravitational waves. 
which then set off further explorations. And then we have now enhanced quantum sensing capabilities being added to that, so that we might do even better. This weaving back and forth between exploration, translation, translation and making possible more exploration, and this innovation, exploration, sort of symbiosis is something that is very, very natural to what happens by NSF to NSF across the nation. And some things happen even in shorter time scales. For example, Google, which was a digital libraries project that was proposed by two graduate students, four years later in the annual report, mentioned the formation of a company called Google between 1994 and 1998. Sometimes this kind of synergy happens much more in a shorter time frame, not necessarily intentionally, but that's the beauty of what happens to all the ideas that are unleashed by NSF, calendar is unleashed by NSF and others. And the other thing that when I think about NSF is that NSF is everywhere, and therefore we can and should make possible prosperity everywhere. Let me give you a few examples on that. When we have the AI initiative at NSF, again, based on four or five decades of unbelievable progress made that makes possible the AI of today. But then when we started thinking about the AI institutes across the nation, I said that we should have AI in every state, meaning that AI investments should make possible K-12 inspirations, should make, to make possible community college inspirations, four-year college inspirations, research university inspirations, theory, industry inspirations, entrepreneurial ecosystems inspirations, and more. And that talent and ideas everywhere across our nation needs to be unleashed through this platform of AI. And therefore, through the such thinking that other such technologies in the future can be connected and leveraged through talent and ideas from everywhere. Likewise, the quantum platform through quantum institutes launched in partnership with DOE and others. Again, the quantum platform idea should be such that a fifth grader or eighth grader from rural Kansas, let's say Manhattan, Kansas, should be able to dial into this platform and get excited and get their STEM spark inspired because of the fact that this is accessible to all so that they might get inspired and become that talent for the future that unleashes the ideas for the future. And therefore, NSF is engaged in not only what is making possible the industries of tomorrow today, but the work that is happening today is also going to make possible the future of the industries of the future and industries of tomorrow possible. And that's what is fantastic about what NSF is able to do and NSF is eager to do. And that we will do strengthening of this use inspired solutions focus by leveraging the curiosity driven discovery based activities, but then also at the same time, further strengthening the curiosity and discovery based activities at even a higher level of intensity so that, that we might have this unbelievable unleashing as a set of ideas and talent. I look forward to the discussion today and the opportunity to hear from everyone the perspective and ideas of how we can foster success at this very important moment in our nation's history. Thank you so much for the time today and I look forward to the engagement with all of you and my fellow colleagues. Thank you, Panch, for your inspiring words. It's, it's been a pleasure to have the chance to work with you in this administration. Um, ever since uh, my service on the Biden-Harris transition team when I had the honor of being the NSF agency review team lead. Uh, and it's been uh, an ex extraordinary, a little bit less than 100 days of serving in the administration with you. So thank you very much. Um, I noticed that we do not have, um, we only have a couple of questions, but uh, I, will say, I will ask you a question, which I just got in. A question for Panch. What will mechanisms will be put in place to ensure that the use inspired side of NSF plans do not squeeze out the curiosity driven side of NSF? An excellent question. And that's why I shared the example that I shared to show that I look at this, the use inspired research as a cross cutting platform that leverages all the fantastic work that is happening in the various directorates of NSF, but more importantly, enrich the activities in the verticals of all the directorates of NSF. In fact, I find that the use inspired research in fact is gonna unleash even more fundamental discoveries and fundamental curiosity driven approaches and innovations that's gonna happen. And I don't look at this as a zero sum game. I want to be very clear about that. This is a massively growing effort 
that is going to ensure the growth of the curiosity driven discovery based research even more than the use inspired translational activities that you will imagine would make possible because we all know that we all know that ai of today is not would not have been possible without that work that has happened over the last five decades as i said the industries of the future of the industries of tomorrow is what is happening in the labs today and therefore we have to further enrich that and make it even more strong in order for us to ensure that our nation is in the vanguard of competitiveness that we are able to ensure that all talent everywhere in hbcus in hsis in tribal colleges and universities everywhere everywhere across the nation across the geography of the nation geography of the nation rural urban everywhere to be completely felt that they are part of this revolution that we are entering into so i am truly excited by this and i am so delighted by the focus of the biden harris administration in ensuring that prosperity is going to be unleashed everywhere and i want nsf to be that catalyst with others to make that possible at speed and scale all right thank you um, it's now my pleasure to introduce our next panelist, uh, Dr. Francis Collins. Francis Collins is the 16th director of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, he was originally nominated for the appointed to the position by President Barack Obama and confirmed by the Senate. Um, he is becoming the FDR of uh, NIH directors because he is now entering his uh, fourth presidential term as uh, NIH director. Uh, President Biden asked him to continue to serve early, earlier this year. Um, so he, he is the only presidential appointed NIH director to serve more than one administration. In this role, Dr. Collins oversees the work of the largest supporter of biomedical research in the world, spanning the spectrum from basic to clinical research. Uh, Dr. Collins is a physician geneticist noted for his landmark discoveries of disease genes and his leadership of the International Human Genome Project, which culminated in April 2003 with the completion of a finished sequence of the Human DNA Instruction Book. Uh, he served as director of the National Human Genome Research Institute at NIH from 1993 through 2008. Uh, a dedicated public servant, I give you Dr. Collins. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kay, and let me say uh, what a privilege it is to be on a panel with these distinguished panel members, uh, Punch and Ellen and Marsha, and thank you, Kay, for being our very capable moderator. And it is a really interesting time to have this conversation about where we're going uh, with the science investments of the United States, and it is my privilege to be continuing to serve in a way that I never expected to, uh, now going on 12 years as the NIH director. I hadn't heard the FDR connection before, Kay. I'm not sure how to take that, but I think I will, I will assume it was well-intentioned. Thank you, <laughs> that was kind of you. Uh, and I might also say, um, just by way of uh, a little reflection on your mention of the role that I had the privilege of playing uh, leading the Human Genome Project, Today is also DNA Day. April 25th um, is always the day that we choose. And why do we choose that day? Well, because April 25th, 1953, 60 years, 68 years ago today, was the publication in Nature of a single page article describing the double helix as the molecular basis of heredity, uh, which many people point to as having been a pretty significant milestone, I have to agree. Exactly 50 years later, we completed all the goals of the Human Genome Project in April of 2003. And to see the way in which the ability uh, to gather data about nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, from every species and every kind of application, from very basic uh, to very clinical, you know, is indeed a remarkable thing to have watched emerge and develop, and it continues uh, to go forward in really exciting ways, now including such things as CRISPR-Cas gene editing to actually contemplate the potential cure of thousands of genetic diseases for which we know the misspelling, but we've not previously had a scalable approach uh, to try to uh, approach treatment for things like sickle cell and many of them. So yes, a little reflection on DNA Day. But now on to what I was supposed to talk about. Uh, first of all, I think most of the people listening to this are pretty familiar with NIH, uh, so I don't think I need to do a lot of a 101, but just again, a quick snapshot. We do, at the present time, enjoy, thank you, Congress, a $42 billion a year 
uh, annual budget, and the president has just proposed in the so-called skinny budget for FY22, increasing that by $9 billion uh, to 51. And I'll come back to that in a minute because it has a very specific component to it that's really quite bold and novel called ARPA-H. Um, our funds largely go out to extramural grantees uh, who are located in all those fantastic universities and institutes and colleges and small businesses across the country and quite a few outside the country because we are also very interested and invested in global health, one of my personal passions. And out of that, uh, we think things have gone pretty well. We're now approaching 150 Nobel Prizes that have been given uh, to individuals supported by NIH. Punch uh, showed that interesting double helix of uh, the sort of comparison between the basic science and the applied. Uh, that's a nice way to, to point out the balance. And we at NIH have very much uh, that same commitment. About 52% of our budget uh, goes to basic science, which is not specifically focused on a disease. And the remainder is more disease oriented, is the applied part, some of which is more translational and some of which goes all the way to clinical trials. We work as part of this ecosystem involving uh, the private sector in terms of biotechnology and uh, also, of course, pharmaceutical industry. And we find all sorts of ways uh, to try to make those partnerships more effective than ever at a time where no sector has all the skills. And we want to be sure we're building on collaborative opportunities. I have to say a little bit about COVID as a way of describing where we are right now, because it's been a consuming passion and experience and responsibility for everyone at NIH for the last 15 months. I'm speaking to you from my home office in Chevy Chase, where I have pretty much been a hermit for those 15 months, uh, working from here with half of our staff in our intramural program, which is about 11% of our budget. Uh, working uh, remotely by telework, except for those who need a lab bench or who are running our hospital. We run the largest research hospital in the world, the clinical center at NIH. And to come there, you need to be somebody for whom medicine has kind of not provided much in the way of answers. And so you come to be part of a clinical trial. And those are our partners and all the progress we've made in that clinical center, everything from the first uh, discoveries of how chemotherapy could work to more recent breakthroughs in such things as gene therapy or the treatment of depression depends on those partners. Otherwise, we would not be able to be where we are. But it has been a tough uh, 15 months. You heard yesterday in the symposium from some of our heroes there, particularly Barney Graham, who's a person who working in our vaccine research center, determined some really critical issues about the structure of the spike protein on the surface of that SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. Uh, that makes it possible to design a messenger RNA vaccine, which is also pioneered in that VRC after some earlier work by DARPA, and which has turned what otherwise would be a much darker situation into something we now can begin to see our way out of, namely the mRNA vaccines that were then adopted by Moderna and Pfizer and which have now been uh, delivered uh, to um, about 126 million people at least have had one dose. Uh, and that is phenomenal to be able to say uh, at this point in this pandemic. Nonetheless, I think we have to recognize, uh, as, as I imagine all of you thinking about every day, what a terrible tragedy this has been. In the United States alone, the loss of 570,000 lives and many more internationally. You can't look at what's happening right now in India without feeling heartbroken about the way in which uh, this is in a terrible second surge in that country, uh, taking thousands of lives a day. So everything that we can do as scientists to try to counter that is something that we have to invest in. And that's what we've been trying uh, to do uh, with the role and responsibility we have at NIH. I think you will be giving an award to Tony Fauci this afternoon, and that's well-deserved indeed. And what a remarkable scientific leader he has been and a public communicator and continues to be. Tony and I probably talk at least twice a day on the average uh, circumstances, just to be sure we're bringing every kind of skill and resource together to try to tackle this worst pandemic in 103 years. And you've seen what's happened with vaccines, which has broken all records in terms of having FDA vaccines approved for emergency use in 11 months, uh, when previous vaccines have never really achieved that in less than about five years. 
Less may have been said about the therapeutics part in that regard. I co-chair along with Paul Stoffels, who's the chief scientist for Johnson & Johnson, a remarkable group called ACTIVE, which is a public-private partnership focused on uh, prioritizing the therapeutic agents that have the greatest promise, developing master protocols uh, to run highly powered, rigorous clinical trials, and setting up the clinical trial networks to make that possible. Uh, there are active trials one, two, three, four, five, and six, which focus on different categories of individuals with different categories of therapeutics. We have learned a lot along the way in terms of what works and what doesn't, and you need to know what doesn't as well so that you don't end up uh, wasting opportunities by providing people with things that are not going to help them. But we are very much on the road with that. I think what everybody would agree is what we really need is a game changer right now, is a highly effective, orally available, small molecule antiviral, perhaps targeted against one of the weak spots of this virus, like its protease that it requires for processing the 3CL protease. We are aggressively pursuing that. But those are longer term processes that take you more than the few months that we've had so far, but we must not miss the chance to keep pushing that, not just for this pandemic, but for what may be coming next. A lot of us spending a lot of time thinking about lessons learned right now. And then in the area of diagnostics, I think everybody would agree we got off to a bit of a rough start in terms of being able to test for the presence of this virus uh, back a year ago, a little more. And yet then that began to capture momentum and we got testing up and going, but virtually all the testing was being done in May or June of last year in large scale big box laboratories where samples had to be sent off to the lab to be assayed and then the results sent back, which meant there was automatically a delay of at least a day and sometimes longer than that. What we really need for this pandemic and for lots of other applications is point of care diagnostics that are readily amenable to giving you an answer within 15 minutes and can be done without the need for extensive technology training. And so we at NIH just about exactly, in fact, it was exactly a year ago today, the Congress decided to give us a boost in our support systems for diagnostics. And we designed a program called RADx, which stands for Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics. And Bruce Tromberg, who directs the Institute of Bioimaging and Bioengineering, and who's a very capable entrepreneurial bioengineer, uh, set up a program four days later, which basically turned NIH into a venture capital organization. <laughs> We invited small businesses and academic labs that had ideas about how to do rapid and accurate testing for the presence of the virus in a nasal swab or a saliva sample to bring forward their ideas, most of those on a rather small scale. And then we threw them into what we call a shark tank, which was populated by business experts, technology experts, engineers, supply chain experts, manufacturing people, economists and figured out which of these had the promise to scale up within a few months and contribute to what was a very significant need for point of care testing for COVID. I can tell you as of today, there are 34 of those advanced platforms that have gone all the way through our innovation funnel and have come out the other side, given substantial amounts of fun funding to scale up and are now contributing today about two and a half million tests per day. Most of those point of care including the first home tests, uh, which are now available in a few places in which we are putting together with CDC uh, through a rigorous assessment of how that can actually change the course of this epidemic, if available for free uh, to people in communities, where you basically decide three times a week, uh, let's do this quick nasal swab, 15 minutes later, find out whether you have the virus or not. Hopefully you will change your behavior if you do. Uh, we need to find that part out too. All of that happening in about a year, which is a pretty amazing thing. Unlike what we have really tried to do before, using something called other transactions authority, which is very different than our usual timetable for grant applications, review, and making awards. Partly because of that experience and because of the President Biden's significant interest in seeing these kinds of advances happen faster than before without the obstacles uh, of bureaucracy. Uh, we were delighted to see in the FY22 budget a proposal of an entirely new unit at NIH called ARPA-H, obviously derived uh, from the DARPA mystique, which has been 
uh, much a part of everybody's admiration of government science, but applying it to health. So the H is for health. Uh, this ARPA-H enterprise proposed to be funded in the very first year as, at $6.5 billion dollars would aim to do the kinds of things we did for RADx and others like it in a much more aggressive and well-funded way, giving us a chance to hire program managers, uh, to identify particularly compelling topics, uh, to recruit participants in those uh, projects that might not necessarily normally write a traditional NIH grant, and see what we could do in a very rapid fashion. And we're pretty excited about that especially after the experience we've had in the course of the last year, seeing, because necessity required it, how we could do things in really different ways. And ARPA-H would make that possible on a much larger scale. And not just for infectious diseases, but for cancer, a particular area the president wants to see more work done on. But beyond that, to heart disease, to diabetes, to gene therapy, to cell therapy, all the things that you would really like to see ramped up in a fashion that might not happen without a big push. So this is a big push. Finally, I want to say a couple things about the workforce, because I think that is a source of great concern for all of us. That's our most important resource is the people. It's great to have technologies and buildings and instruments, but if you don't have the people with the vision and who have the support to know they can take risks, uh, then we are not going to make this kind of progress. And let's be clear, this has been a terribly difficult year uh, for everybody involved in science because of COVID-19, especially those who couldn't really do their science work uh, from home because they didn't have a lab bench there and who have therefore lost time and many of them gone through a lot of other stresses as a result. We at NIH are trying to do what we can to try to address this acute stress that's happened to our workforce. For instance, we have provided extensions on the kinds of early stage training grants, uh, the Fs and the Ks, for those of you who know our terminology, which I admit is pretty inscrutable. So F and K awards are being given an opportunity for no cost extensions and actually extensions with cost, but they have to be individually advocated for so we understand the reasons for that. We are extending the eligibility for people who need to stay in this category of being early stage investigators, which gives you a benefit when it comes to peer review. We're being quite lenient about late applications, and we're allowing people to submit preliminary data right up to the time of the review, which we normally wouldn't just because so many people have been slowed down by this effort. We also have become aware, and we were aware before, but it's really apparent now just how much of an added burden falls on individuals who have childcare responsibilities. And let's be clear, that happens more to women than it does to men, but it happens to both. And so we are now offering a $2,500 a year per fellow child care allowance to defray child care costs for those trainees who have children under 13 years or if disabled under 18 years uh, with a licensed child care provider to try to provide some of the benefits here that otherwise had not been available. And we are also, I think, doing everything we can to keep in touch with our trainees uh, about their mental health status and offering the kinds of backup that many of them are finding it need to tap into. And again, we are encouraging people to say that asking for help is a sign of strength. It has been a very tough year uh, for all of those involved in the scientific community, but I'm particularly worried about those uh, who are in the training positions who feel like they're losing time and how are they gonna catch up? We wanna do everything we can uh, to sustain them. Final thing about the workforce that maybe we'll talk about in the discussion is the recognition that 2020 was not only notable for the worst pandemic in 103 years. It was also notable for the, the killing of George Floyd and the number of other events that brought very much in the front of all of our minds, the need to address structural racism in this country. And that also means looking at it in all of our institutions. And we had to say, yes, at NIH, we are probably part of that more than 400 year tradition that includes written into some of the structures and the way we do business Issues which maybe we didn't want to think about it this way, but are frankly uh, in full up of the kinds of history that brings forward this concept of structural racism. And we believe it is now our responsibility to act upon that. And so putting together a very hardworking and visionary uh, group of about 75 individuals in our scientific community, most of them people of color, uh, and, and this is put together in something called UNITE because it has five components, each of which starts with the letter U-N-I-T or E. 
Uh, we are coming forward with a variety of bold proposals, uh, including that we are determined to do something about the funding gap uh, between African Americans and other applicants, which we have studied and we don't understand, and we just need to figure out how we're going to solve that. We also have put forward two different programs. One is a common fund program, and one is from our National Institute of, Men of Minority Health and Health Disparities, which aims to enhance substantially the way in which we're approaching research on health disparities and health inequities, which are all around us in our healthcare system, and not just study the problem, or as some cynics have said, not just admire the problem, but actually institute interventions uh, to see if there are ways that we could change that dynamic for the better. So watch that. We're going to be deeply engaged in this. There will be a lot more coming out about it, but this will be a major push uh, for NIH going forward. Finally, I just want to say, despite all those stresses, I think for anybody who's interested in coming into the scientific community, this is a phenomenal time of opportunity. Uh, I see Punch nodding because I think you said something very similar a minute ago. And it's true across all of the disciplines that we have the fortunate role here of overseeing uh, the opportunities to make discoveries happen at a pace that was unprecedented is all around us. I think we have seen uh, some enthusiastic response, at least in some quarters, uh, from young people based on what science brought to address COVID-19. In medical schools, we have the Fauci effect where uh, applications for medical school have gone up substantially. This is sort of our Sputnik moment. And okay, a little bit of maybe a silver lining in what has otherwise been a very, very set of dark clouds about COVID. And we should make the most of that and spread the excitement about how science can solve the problems that our planet faces uh, from health issues to climate change, uh, if we basically have the best talent involved. But we have to have all the talent involved, which is why I think this focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion has to be not around the edges, but right in the middle of everything we do. And I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Collins, for your words. And thank you for reminding us that it's DNA Day. So happy DNA Day to everyone. Um, and it's been such a pleasure to work so cooperatively and closely with you uh, over the past few months on- It has indeed, thank you, Ken. Topics. I've seen more of you, even though we have never been in the same room for the past, uh, all of us, for the past two years, it's been a, a, a delight to be able to work closely with you on these important issues. For those of you who are particularly interested in Dr. Collins' concluding remarks about UNITE, and the need to build equity and inclusion in the federal scientific workforce. Please stay tuned after this session when we will have another uh, open public session on rebuilding the federal scientific workforce in which some of my OSTP colleagues will be participating. Um, before we go to the, the next uh, speaker, I'd like to, um, I'd like to ask a, a question from the audience. Um, how NIH can help the billions of people on our planet who are not scientists or engineers uh, harness their own individual ideas, imaginations, and ambitions to you know, make the world a better place. Do you have any thoughts about how NIH can, can help non-scientists and engineers? Well, I think this is the issue of citizen science, and we're very much a fan of figuring out ways to be more inclusive of those inputs uh, sometimes in a very specific way. Uh, we're certainly excited about programs that invite uh, high school kids uh, to compete uh, for some technological challenge. Um, I think particularly at the moment, as people are facing with all of these other health crises, I'm contemplating we are about to in, engage in a major study of what happens to people who've had COVID but don't seem to get completely better after a couple of weeks. Uh, so-called long COVID, and a big part of our input from that has been a citizen science group of COVID survivors who are sharing with us their experiences in a very powerful way. And there are tens of thousands of them all linked up together, providing the kind of answers to questions that otherwise might be hard to obtain. That's an example. I'll be in a, a hearing on this long COVID in front of the House Energy and Commerce Committee on Wednesday, uh, we aim to invest a lot of resources trying to figure out what is the actual basis 
of these prolonged symptoms of brain fog, fatigue, shortness of breath, um, sometimes fever. What is that all about? And we need to get answers to that. And citizen scientists uh, can help us a lot in that regard. But there are many other ways. I know NSF is also uh, very engaged in providing opportunities for people who are not doctoral trained individuals in science or engineering uh, to play significant roles in science adventures. Thank you so much for extending the, the message that we're all trying to send that science is for everyone. And yeah. you know, as I started out by saying, it's a, a priority for the Biden-Harris administration to ensure that opportunities to do science and to benefit from science are extended to all Americans. So thank you for, for that message. Um, I'd like to introduce now our next speaker, Dr. Ellen Stofan. Uh, she is the Undersecretary for Science and Research at the Smithsonian Institution where she oversees the science museums and science research centers, as well as many other Smithsonian activities. Uh, her focus is on the Smithsonian's collective scientific initiatives and commitment to research, especially in addressing current issues such as biodiversity, climate change, global health, and the search for life in our solar system and beyond. Um, she is a former chief scientist at NASA, and served as the principal advisor to the NASA Administrator on science programs and strategic planning. Um, she was also previously the director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. Uh, and she came to the museum with more than 25 years of experience in space administration and planetary science. Dr. Stofan. Thank you, Kay, and thank you for having me here today. It's really an honor to be on this panel, and I think you're going to hear that a lot of the remarks and themes I'm going to be touching on are ones that Francis and Ponch uh, already discussed. Uh, let's see. We're all getting good at this after an entire year of it. Um, the Smithsonian was founded in 1846 for the purpose of the increase and diffusion of knowledge. Um, and I would argue that we're in a uniquely challenging time that requires this more than ever. From COVID to racial injustice to the climate crisis, evidence-based decision-making is mandatory. And the Smithsonian is uniquely positioned to bridge the gap between research and the public. And under the Biden-Harris administration, this priority is now policy. Um, because many of you know that I'm biased, um, I'm going to start way out beyond our planet uh, and then return homewards. In the last several decades, we've increasingly understood that determining how our universe, our galaxy, and our solar system work are critical to understanding the fundamental questions on how our pale blue dot came to be and possible future states of our planet. The last few weeks have shown the fruition, last month or so, I should say, have uh, shown the fruition of the Obama-Biden initiatives at NASA with the landing of the Perseverance rover uh, and the flights of Ingenuity. And I was really pleased to see the third flight of the little Ingenuity helicopter um, went quite well this morning. I am uh, being very vocal actually in insisting that a future astronaut to Mars actually bring the Ingenuity uh, rover back to live in the Smithsonian uh, next to the Wright Flyer. We have imaged a black hole in the past several years. We're roving across the surface of Mars and even preparing to send a drone to Saturn's moon Titan. And we're reading humans so critical to the search for the ev evidence of past life on Mars beyond low Earth orbit for the first time uh, in quite some time, over 40 years. And we are preparing to launch a telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, that will study the atmospheres of planets around other stars in concert with the very large telescopes that we're planning right here on Earth that will be critical to searching for life uh, beyond Earth and other Earths. You know, to me, and I think Francis and, and Kay were just touching on this, you know, to me, we're on the edge of this revolution. It's an incredibly exciting time in science, and especially in terms of understanding planets and understanding habitability. And this administration stands poised to make investments in science and technology that are going to make this happen. Answering the question of whether life had a distinct second or even third origin in our solar system, 
studying other solar systems around other stars, um, allowing us to study planets uh, that are in stages of evolution that the Earth went through that we've only been able to model, like snowball Earth or magma ocean Earth. This is an absolute revolution that we're on the edge of, and it's only possible with investments in science and technology that not just benefit science, but drive our economy forward and help us to retain leadership in critical fields. And I know that this administration understands this. But of course, we face an unprecedented crisis at home where knowledge is required for resilience and adaptation and gathering the data required for solutions as we move towards achieving the new Biden-Harris uh, emissions goals. Whether it's our Smithsonian Global Health Program that you see highlighted there in the, in the center where we are studying coronaviruses in bats around the world and looking in, around the world for other zoonotic diseases uh, that are warming climate and growing population threatens to bring the next pandemic Investments in fundamental science and research like this will help us be ready. At the Smithsonian, we're trying to change the climate and conservation narrative by shining a spotlight on evidence-based solutions. Through Earth Optimism, a global movement we launched in 2017, we're providing hope by sharing and amplifying stories of success and empowering people to take action. We've been designing research with communities in mind to help them better manage resources, restore species and ecosystems and sustain livelihoods while also creating resilience to climate change. In the center top there is an image of our Agua Salud project at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Center in Panama, where we're engaging whole communities in sustainable forestry that improves water retention, carbon sequester and carbon sequestration while also refor reforesting degraded areas with tree species that are more economically valuable to the community, mitigating climate-related disasters, supporting biodiversity, and providing livelihood opportunities. Recent other studies we've done have shown the greater impact of climate change on the very largest trees in the forest. We need detailed knowledge like this uh, in order to keep forest systems healthy um, as our climate changes. We have to get communities to be part of the solution. So our working land and seascapes amplification and innovation grants incentivize social science and broader partnerships. It increases science and community co-production across more than 20 programs across the globe. We are utilizing data and innovative tools and technology to inform policies and expedite conservation decision making. For example, a rapid assessment protocol developed by scientists at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center is being deployed across the largest ever oyster restoration project in the Chesapeake Bay. This new tool will allow managers and scientists to determine if and how restoration is working and adapt accordingly. The Coastal Carbon Research Coordination Network, co-led by CERC Conservation International with multiple other agencies and universities, is increasing awareness of the potential for our coastlines to help us manage carbon more effectively. And our Marine Geo Network is assessing blue carbon storage, such as seagrasses uh, there in the lower uh, right, understanding the helping us understand the effects of human activity and warming climate on these critical habitats that really do help with this issue of blue carbon storage. Deploying tracking technologies, as you see in the uh, bottom center, to better understand animal movement and inform land use decisions, such as protected area des designations and infrastructure development. This includes partnering on uh, the American Prairie Reserve learning how to reintroduce species to restore ecosystems even as the climate warms. We have to do this research to, in order to stem the biodiversity crisis. And the Biden-Harris commitment to the 30 by 30 initiative helps us to, is going to help us really use science to understand how to make that 30 have the biggest impact for our planet, again, especially in terms of uh, preserving biodiversity. Okay, now see if I can figure out 
how to make the slide move. There we go. Research is critical and necessary, and the administration has a commitment to do that. But as the Smithsonian, and as we've already discussed on, in, in the talks previous to this, how do we ensure that the public understands the crises, the need to act, and how they can participate? Um, in the upper right, we do this through exhibits like the one there, which is our deep time exhibit, which hopefully will soon reopen uh, at, at the Smithsonian's Natural History Museum, where we can do things, and that's our director of, of the Natural History Museum there in the upper center, uh, Kirk Johnson, with fossils of palm fronds in Alaska. Our deep time exhibit really goes into understanding how climate has changed across the history of the earth, the fact that we once had palm trees in Alaska and helping people to understand climate is capable of changing that much and we need to ensure that this does not happen again. And this is why uh, turning the tide on emissions is absolutely critical. In the upcoming renovated National Air and Space Museum, we're going to have an exhibit talking about how critical Earth observations are to understanding our planet. We as the Smithsonian, but certainly all of us, have to help us understand, the public to understand the importance of evidence-based decision-making. We need to teach people to think like a scientist, not just to engage and inspire the next generation of STEM workforce. And I um, add the D and C to STEM for design and computing, but to help the public understand the why. Um, in the bottom there, you see the tagline from our Vaccines and Us uh, website that we just launched last week which is uh, designed in partnership with cultural institutions across the country to help the public understand COVID, how vaccines work, how these vaccines were developed and tested, all to help uh, reduce vaccine resistance amongst the public. We've developed curriculum like Mosquito and exhibits like Outbreak to help the public understand the past, present, and future of pandemic disease, especially how disease vectors uh, that will be uh, accelerated by climate change. And in the lower uh, left, with programs like Urban Waterways at the Anacostia Community Museum, we've begun the work that is so important to this administration and so critical to this country, making sure that our climate solutions recognize the history of environmental injustice and working with communities to ensure future environmental justice. As Ponch discussed, we have all have a, and, and Francis was just touching on, we all have a critical role in ensuring that the STEM workforce starts to look more like our population, that every child understands the significant contributions to science and technology that have been made by people who look like them, and we play a critical role in telling those stories at the Smithsonian and that we are all working to create inclusive pathways and workplaces. This includes recognizing the racial injustices and roadblocks that are faced uh, in the STEM fields by women and men uh, of color in particular, and this has already been touched on. This administration has clearly laid this out as a key priority and our current crises demand no less. We need all hands on deck to help us find life on other worlds, stem the biodiversity crisis, and understand how to live uh, and heal our warming planet. With Biden-Harris investments in science and technology and in the future, um, I think we are truly uh, going to see really significant process of progress being made and, and possibly make all of us into Earth optimists. So thank you and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Ellen, for those wonderful words and for letting us know, all know that the Smithsonian is a part of our federal science enterprise and is a, and it is a, a research partner for so many of us. Um, thank you for those words. And um, I noticed you have not attracted any specific questions yet, but I'm sure you will get some as we go along. Um, and uh, so, Thank you all for, for highlighting some of the themes of your federal science agencies. Uh, maybe in a few months, we will, we will be able to have a much larger gathering of other science leaders uh, in the Biden-Harris administration. 
at this moment within the first 100 days. Uh, we are a small but mighty band. Um, and I'd like now to turn to uh, Dr. Marsha McNutt as a discussant of sorts about the many activities the, the Academy of Sciences has been, has been supporting federal science agencies in doing. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Marsha McNutt, who is a geophysicist and the 22nd president of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, from 2013 to 2016, she was editor in chief of the science family of journals. And she was also director of the US Geological Survey from 2009 to 2013, during which time USGS responded to a number of major disasters, including the Deepwater Horizon oil spill at which time I saw a lot of her from my previous time um, at the OSGP uh, for her work to help contain that spill. Um, Dr. McNuck was awarded the US Coast Guard's Meritorious Service Medal. And now our leader for this wonderful uh, National Academy of Sciences meeting taking place for the second year in this space where we all live, I, I present to you Dr. Mar Marcia McNutt. Well, thank you very much, Kay, for that introduction. And I want to thank all my fellow panelists for what have been very in <clears throat> insightful and illuminating comments. I thought I'd take a slightly different uh, tack in my uh, presentation today. And that is, um, Kay, you mentioned uh, all the disasters that um, I had to preside over as USGS director. And uh, I guess that leads me to my first point. And that is namely that the National Academy of Sciences was born in crisis. And it is through the ensuing crises over the past more than 150 years that the National Academy has helped science rise to its finest moments in service to society. So um, going back to the beginning, we were founded during the Civil War and it was the brainchild of Abraham Lincoln that he wanted the scientists on his side. And that's why he created the National Academy of Sciences. And the National Academy has been on the side of helping governments through the ages rise to challenges. Uh, we got a, a, a big um, boost uh, in our advising capacity during World War I, when all sorts of new types of warfare were suddenly being waged and the government needed to have science. And then again in World War II, where science proved to be decisive in the outcome of the war. And the National Academy was there to help by deciding what was the important science that needed to be supported, how could that scientist, science be used and how it would turn the tide in the war. And now today we're faced with two really existential challenges. The first is climate change. It is a slow moving crisis to which we unfortunately at this point have to respond very decisively and very quickly. And the other challenge is our crumbling infrastructure that prevents us from achieving our national true potential, from engaging everyone in the country and from uh, helping businesses as well as institutions have the basic structure that they need to thrive. So um, let me start with climate change. Clearly all of our federal agencies have very strong science incorporated in them, whether it's the Department of Agriculture or the Department of Defense, the Department of Interior or the Department of Commerce, there is science in all of these aspects of government and science that really needs to be brought to bear on the climate change problem. In USDA, we're concerned about um, crops and whether they will get outside their uh, zone of maximum productivity because of changing climate or crops that just may not even be cultivatable in the areas of the country that they are right now. Or take the Department of Defense. 
The Department of Defense is concerned about rising seas inundating its naval bases and how climate change could actually be a threat multiplier in um, securing our borders and um, peace uh, globally. And then we look at, at the Department of Energy, which is responsible for uh, energy innovation. And we know that there is no solution to the climate crisis without energy innovation. Or NOAA within the Department of Commerce that is very concerned about the increase in the intensity and the duration of uh, climate problems such as droughts or um, the intensity of hurricanes. All of these things are of course being dealt with in a sort of piecemeal fashion across the country. And so this brings me to what the role of the National Academies can be. We know that it is not easy and often fraught with all sorts of negative repercussions when we try to reorganize government to respond to the crisis du jour. Uh, all of these federal agencies have very strong congressional structure, which produces their budgets and um, gives oversight to their activities. And reorganizing federal agencies to make for new missions or moving missions between agencies has always been problematic. If for no other reason, then each of these agencies has its own culture. And when you try to move uh, a group from an agency with one culture to another culture, then uh, it, it can be um, something that is not successful. But here at the National Academy, we actually can be more, uh, more innovative and um, more nimble in terms of helping to guide what are disparate portfolios in the federal government. So in the case of climate change, we have actually set up a cross-divisional new initiative at the academy that includes the social sciences, um, the built environment, uh, the uh, energy uh, issues, and um, environmental issues, and many um, other aspects, human health, the human health aspects of climate change. We can bring these all together and help create not only a forum for uh, considering um, problems and solutions, but also be um, a, an umbrella that pulls together um, many of the different agencies. We, our purpose is to advise the federal agencies, and in many cases, our studies uh, incorporate many more than one at the same time and can understand the perspectives that all need to be brought together. Another uh, big uh, new initiative that we are launching is one in infrastructure. We've already discussed on this panel the problem of bringing all of America to the table for solutions, bringing all of American to science, bringing all of America to engineering. And one obvious solution to this is to increase broadband coverage across the entire nation. But can we increase broadband uh, across the entire nation without impinging on bands of the spectrum that suddenly mean none of our GPSs work anymore? I mean, that would certainly not be a good solution to a very important problem. And it's for issues like that, that the Academy can help to understand what the problem looks like from all aspects and to find solutions that actually achieve our outcome in the long run. So uh, I just wanna say that the Academy stands ready to help and to help um, smooth the uh, silos that can be created within the federal agency and to help bring people from outside the federal government as well to the table. We have a much easier time convening people from academia, from industry, from government, and even international voices in all of these very difficult problems. So it's my pleasure to join you all on this uh, 
wonderful panel discussion today, and I look forward to questions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. McNutt, and thank you for continuing to uphold the long tradition of the National Academy of Sciences and providing scientific advice to, well, the American people, to Congress, and to the federal science agencies. Um, we've seen many examples of how the Academy has adapted, especially in this pandemic year, to providing actionable, real-time scientific evidence that has immediate impact on the way we live now. Um, I think it's a reflection of how in the past year, we've certainly seen a lot of fast science, fast but excellent science. Uh, the scientific community has had to respond in near real time to changing conditions. Um, we've seen the revolution in scientific publishing and the sharing of data, not just genetic sequences, but all, all types of scientific data. And so we are living through a moment, not only for scientific communication and research, but also, of course, um, a moment for really improving and strengthening the connections that scientific knowledge has to the everyday lives of Americans and people around the world. So thank you all for participating in this revolution. Uh, and, you know, when we return to something resembling normal, we know that we'll be that we'll never go back to the way it was before because we have all been transformed. The scientific enterprise has been transformed. The federal enterprise has been transformed, and of course, um, Americans' relationship to scientific information and knowledge we hope has been transformed as well. So, thank you all for being part of this discussion. I'd like to extend our discussion with a couple of questions that have come in to all of us and also to individual leaders. So let me start with a question from a Dr. Alberts in the audience uh, about the concentration of research. I mean, he notes that the concentration of research activity on our two coasts threatens to get more extreme. Are there ideas for programs that might reverse this continuing trend of concentrating research? And which of course, my editorial edition may work against our vision of making sure that the benefits of science and opportunities to do science are extended to all Americans, no matter where they live. And I have some ideas of, of how we might answer that question, but I would uh, invite uh, Dr. Collins and uh, Ponch and Ellen to answer this question. Well, I can start. It is a very appropriate question. Hello, Bruce Alberts. <laughs> and I know this is something that you care about deeply, as do I. It is troubling when you look at the trends uh, to see how, at least in terms of biomedical research, uh, and Ponch and Ellen can talk about other areas, we do seem to see an increasing uh, concentration of the funding uh, in the sort of top 15 or 20 institutions uh, that have lots of infrastructure and uh, which are very successful in getting their grants uh, supported when they send them in. And yet we know the talent is not limited to the coasts of this country. Many of the people who we most want to bring into our scientific workforce uh, grew up in other places, uh, maybe had the best chance to learn about science and get excited about science in their own locations that didn't happen to be Boston or San Francisco. And so we have to be sure that we are doing everything we can to spread the scientific opportunities around. At NIH, a major signature program is called IDEA, I-D-E-A, which stands for Institutional Development Award. And that those awards go to the 24 states that are not particularly well supplied uh, with research dollars from NIH. And there's a clear, there's a careful definition of how do you get to be an idea state, and people are always arguing about where that line is. But that is, in fact, a place where we put a substantial amount of research dollars. And I am uh, pleased to say that the current Biden-Harris administration seems uh, particularly anxious that that program, if anything, uh, extend its reach uh, beyond what we've been able to do so far because of the awareness that there's such talent out there. The idea states, uh, for instance, can compete for centers of biomedical research excellence, uh, which uh, offer the opportunity uh, for interdisciplinary collaborative efforts. I have a great time whenever I go to an idea state, because I used to travel before a year ago, uh, to visit uh, those COBRI, as they're called, centers, 
and to see the vibrancy of what's happening there uh, in institutions that might not be in our top 20 in terms of awards, but are clearly doing great science. So I also think because of the way in which biomedical research is increasingly possible to conduct uh, in a virtual fashion, because so much of what we are now excited about are computational capabilities, uh, that the need to be in an institution that has a really heavy equipment footprint for a lot of the kinds of things that we would want to see real talent invest in, that's not quite so critical, perhaps. Uh, there are still exceptions, of course. So yeah, I'm Bruce, you're, you're on to something. I'd like to hear what my colleagues say about this. This has got to be a priority for us. We are the United States of America, not the United Coastal States of America, and we should act accordingly. Thank you, Francis. If I can go next, I mean, uh, uh, Bruce, again, thank you so much for the question. And um, coming from a small state myself, let me start right there. I have a deep appreciation for where talent and ideas are everywhere. Everywhere. I've seen it firsthand in terms of the unbelievable talent that we have been able to get in a small state like Arizona and manifest that into unbelievable outcomes through entrepreneurship, through industry leaders, through academic you know, uh, uh, you know, leadership that, that people express themselves in terms of. So I know that talent is everywhere, ideas are every, everywhere. And that's why I keep talking about this again and again and again, this concept of missing millions or turning the invisible visible. This is a very important imperative of NSF. So to your question, you know, we have programs like EPSCOR. To me, EPSCOR is a great program, and, but it should not be limited to that. It's, I would say, icing on the cake but the cake itself should be such that that is across the nation in every form, every program needs to make sure that ideas and talent everywhere is recognized. This is where when I talked about AI in every state when I came in, when I said that, I know that talent is everywhere. And if we don't think that way in the first hand in terms of how we configure our partnerships, how we bring together initiatives, then it is a missed opportunity. Shame on us all. Same thing when I talked about quantum. And, and so I said, these are but only platforms because these platforms can be substituted by anything, replace AI by anything else, it should be that way. But Bruce, there is an underlying thing that we need to all remember. In order to do this, we need to make sure that we are empowering, energizing, making possible and lifting talent and ideas everywhere. Just last week, I had two conversations, let me tell you. I made a presentation to the Association of American Universities, AU presidents and chancellors, and I told them, these are great institutions that you're leaders of. If only you can embrace five, 10 other institutions in your region, that you can lift them all up together in addition to yourself, to your partnerships, wouldn't we all be the better for that? Likewise, I gave a talk to the HBCU uh, you know, leaders last week. I mean, I was told that about 2,000 people tuned into the talk. And there again, I said, the kinds of programs that we are launching, HBCU undergraduate scholarship program, with the 50 HBCUs led by Morehouse, Spellman, and others, these are the kinds of things that we need to consciously do. We have, you know, I'm, I'm putting together panels. We had black, uh, black science uh, scientists panel who gave us fantastic ideas of how to get out of this normal thinking that we have gotten used to, but break out of that and do these innovative things that can embrace talent and ideas everywhere. We are, in fact, in the next National Science Board meeting, we are talking about an MSI panel. We are going to constantly look at and listen to and see how we can do this. And I will leave you with the last point. In order to do this, partnership is the key. I'm so thrilled that my, my, my colleague, Francis, and when I had the first conversation with Francis, that we talked about, Francis, if you remember, is how might we lift the K-12 to scientific spirit across the nation? How might NSF and NIH work together? I think all our agencies can work together. And I know the leadership, like Francis, unbelievable leader, and the leaders in other agencies. I reached out to our uh, incoming secretary of the Department of Energy, Jennifer Granholm and others. So we will have to work together and we will work together. Everybody believes in this. When I hear Ellen talk about this, that talent is important. All of us know that we all share in this. And Amarsha believed this deeply in the, in the academies now to you know, unleash this, this talent and ideas across the nation. So I think we are going to come up with two partnerships. And lastly, partnership with industry. Let's not forget that. Industry and foundations are people that I'm talking to because they too have this desire to want to recruit talent from everywhere. They also want to locate themselves potentially in other parts other than just the two courses. So how might we partner with them to do even better? 
And there's a lot of conversations around that. I can tell you that in addition to the many wonderful existing programs and some pilots at NSF that I'm challenging to asking them to scale them up rapidly, but also introduction of new programs through partnerships, because you are right, Bruce, we need to do this urgently, urgently, in order that our domestic talent can be fully, fully capitalized for the benefit of our nation and benefit of all. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. McNutt to say a few things about what the, the National Academy is doing in terms of addressing geographical considerations in our scientific research capability. So um, great question, Bruce. Hello from your former office. It's um, not at all the way you left it, but uh, you're welcome anytime to come visit. Uh, so this is, um, this is an important problem and one that my perspective on it uh, comes from the fact that I grew up in Minnesota. And Minnesota is probably, in terms of North America, the furthest that you can get from an ocean, the Gulf, the Atlantic, the Pacific, or the Arctic, of any place in America. And as I was growing up, I was very steeped in this admiration for the great public universities, University of Minnesota, University of Wisconsin at Madison, Michigan, Michigan State, all of these fabulous institutions that at the time could stand up to any uh, university in the country when I was younger. And so it's actually only been in the last few decades that there has been this sense of the erosion of the um, um, prestige of these great land grant universities. And instead this thought that everything's happening on the coast. And of course, that's not true. As Ponch says, not everything is happening uh, on the coast. And we recognize at the Academy that there is excellence everywhere. So we have a special initiative right now at the National Academy that rewards our members for finding, nominating, and electing members from underrepresented states and underrepresented R1 institutions, which are all over the country. Because if we can't change the minds of young researchers coming up in the world, that they can make their career anywhere, that they do not have to be on a coast to be recognized. We can do that by, by showing before them these fabulous top-notch scientists who choose to live in Madison, Wisconsin because of the great quality of life or who choose to live in um, Colorado because they love the natural beauty. There is excellence everywhere. But finally, I wanna say a part of the problem is the reluctance of states to support their great state institutions. The Academy can't do this alone. NSF and NIH, as much as they can send grants there, we have to reaffirm the importance of the uh, public, um, the public institutions to be supported by their states. Thank you. Kay Koizumi from Columbus, Ohio, home of Ohio State University is with you all the way. Um, I'd also like to turn to Dr. Sokan for her, her remarks. Uh, fellow Ohioan, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, so we're, we're all Midwesterners here. Um, you know, this is so critical and, and, and we've certainly seen this play out over the last year especially in terms of public understanding and acceptance of science. There are huge divides in this country and some of them do fall along rural, more urban lines. And so to me, this isn't just an imperative for science and getting the best science. It's actually imperative for bringing the country together, especially around public understanding of science when we're facing things like racial injustice, like COVID again, like uh, the climate crisis. And the Smithsonian is actually about to embark on a whole rural initiative. How do we partner with our affiliate museums across the country to make sure we're, we're allowing everybody to benefit off of how, what does history teach us? What can it tell us about the history of this country? What does it tell us about the history of science, the history of developing vaccines? 
uh, the history of why we understand and how we understand that our climate is changing. And so I think from the, the very youngest levels to just an appreciation of the importance and the method and the how of science, this is an absolute uh, Im imperative. And I also wanna say, because I'm sure uh, the first lady would want us to talk about the importance of community colleges across the whole country in this pipeline. And we can't neglect community colleges and the important role that they play in the science pip pipeline, especially in reaching uh, communities of people who are underrepresented in science. So there's so many tools we have out there um, and it's really just the emphasis that we need that, that I know we're all counting on this, this administration to enact. Thank you so much. Let me turn to a couple of other questions, um, some uh, directed at individuals. So um, we have a question for Panch about, related to what Dr. Collins said about extensions for NIH grants. Um, the question is, how NSF is addressing delays and difficulties NSF investigators are experiencing during this time of COVID. Are there similar plans for funded extensions underway at NSF? Thank you so much for asking the question. Absolutely, as Francis was mentioning the various initiatives of NIH, I felt that likewise, you know, NSF has also been right from day one, making sure that we are very tuned into the community and the struggles that is faced with the community and be responsive right away. So individual investigators have been talking to program officers so we can make accommodations. But from an NSF-wide perspective, notwithstanding the fact that we also work with the CARES Act funding and other funding to initiate research that helps support the situation at hand, we can talk about that in a minute. But to address more specifically the challenges faced by investigators, you know, as soon as we got into this, we said that let's see what we can carve out from our existing budgets so that we might address, and I call this in the following way, how might disproportionately affected individuals and disproportionately affected institutions get the support that they need so that their, uh, their, their aspirations are not in any way, you know, other than what has already been to this challenge that they're all facing, that we can see how we can mitigate that to the best extent that we can. So we have been taking that approach primarily. How do we provide support for disproportionately affected institutions and individuals? And therefore we carved out the funds so that we might address those folks at the transition points. It might be an undergraduate research student finishing up that project, a PhD student finishing up that project, a postdoc who's ready to get on and, and get, a, get, a, get a position in academia or an in industry. It might be an early career researcher. It might be a mid-career researcher. All of them have gone through challenges. And as Francis said, there is people who are taking care of their children, their family, and particularly you know, uh, women who have been really challenged in terms of being able to exercise their unbelievable talent but at the same time, having to you know, live through these difficult times, taking care of everything at the same time, we are very, very tuned into that and making sure that our support systems are making that possible. Let me give you a number. We are so thankful to the president and the Congress for the American Rescue Plan, support that we received of $600 million. Even before that, we have deployed, added to $600 million, when you look at that, almost close to a billion dollars of support that we said that we have to intentionally, intentionally and with intensity make sure that we support all the people at transition points. And as I said, this proportion of institutions and individuals being the focus. And through supplements, through other kinds of programs that we have put in place, and there have been very innovative ideas that have also been put in place in the interest of time. I may not be able to go through everything, but please tune into NSF and make sure that this is something that you are asking your program officer. We will make sure that they're widely distributing to scientific societies, to academies and other kinds of venues the kinds of efforts that are being put out there. But I want all of you to feel, if you're one of those who's feeling really you know, affected and want to help, please never hesitate to talk to your program officer, to NSF, anybody at NSF, and we will make sure that we are there to help you because this is a moment that we cannot and must not lose talent and ideas in our nation. Exceedingly important to make sure that we're accelerating rather than slowing down. So thank you so much for the question and we stand ready to serve and help. Thank you so much. I have a question for Dr. Collins um, asking, you know, what approaches NIH is taking to better engage the public on scientific issues, whereas there, where there have been recent challenges on the proliferation of misinformation about science on various issues? Well, that is certainly very much front and center right now, as we are in a circumstance with 
vaccines that have been proven remarkably safe and effective that other people in other countries are wishing somehow they had access to. And yet we have in this country a wonderful opportunity uh, for virtually everyone over 16 uh, to get immunized. And yet we have a lot of resistance and concern. And I guess one of the things I should say is that every person who's expressing a lack of confidence maybe has a little different reason than every other person. And we shouldn't try to assume that we understand all of those reasons. We should do a lot of listening. But one of the reasons is the misinformation, which is so widely out there about vaccines, um, conspiracy theories about how these came to be, what kind of chips would be put into your body if you get immunized, uh, that this will cause infertility, um, uh, all of the, all of those things that you've heard about, which are widely available on social media, if one goes and looks. So what is the right response for the scientific community? And it's not just the government. I'm going to sort of push this back and say, this is on all of us as scientists. If we have been given the privilege of careers in this truth-seeking activity called science, and we have therefore access uh, to the facts, it is not sufficient to go in the lab and close the door and say that's somebody else's problem. We all really have to have uh, some sense of responsibility in a generous, uh, understanding, uh, good listener kind of way of sharing what we know and what we don't know, being honest about both of those. Uh, certainly, we are finding in the midst of this COVID crisis, particularly strong sense of need here to get the word out. And I guess one of the things, though, that I have learned about that in the course of the last few months is that if you really want to get information that's correct and uh, trusted into the uh, hearts and minds of people who need it, it's probably most important to empower community voices uh, to come alongside. Uh, for me, as a government employee, uh, to say to somebody who's wondering about vaccines, it's fine, they're safe and effective, is a lot less convincing than if it's somebody in their own hometown. Uh, maybe the person who teaches high school biology who explains that to the kids in the class or the doctor they go to or the pastor of a local church. So I guess once again, this sort of points out if we really want to make headway in terms of literacy, of the general public about things that really could make a difference between life and death, uh, that means we've got to incorporate all of the uh, valid inputs and make sure the community is part of that process and not just that we're helicoptering in as scientists saying, we're smart and you're not, so take our answers and don't be really glad we gave them to you. That doesn't work. <laughs> no, no finger wagging. <laughs> and, uh, being uh, uh, willing to enlist and empower all the partners we can. The news media can be really helpful, and there are lots of credible news media sources that we should make ourselves available for. So scientists, if you're being asked <laughs> to provide information, even if you're not quite so used to that, do it anyway. Be sure you get the facts really clearly and put them in front of the people who are searching for it. I think a lot of the reporters on COVID have actually gotten a pretty uh, sophisticated view put out there, but they only get there by depending on all of us in the scientific community to answer their phone calls. So that's part of what we have to do as well. I wish I had an answer about the social media problem. And obviously people will be debating this in terms of what is the responsibility uh, of the media vendors uh, to monitor what's being put out there on their own platforms, and to what extent do they need to step in and basically say, no, you're not going to be allowed to say something that's demonstrably false and is going to hurt people without being accused of violating <laughs> the First Amendment. So it's, it's a challenging balance, and I don't know that we've quite got it right, but I'm not sure what getting it right looked like. So yeah, just kind of coming back to the original question, I think all of us at this time and at all times as scientists we ought to be sort of willing to spend some fraction of our time explaining what we do and why it matters and answering those questions. So uh, that means volunteering. Go to the JCs, give a talk at lunch, uh, 
when your high school biology teacher says, I want a scientist to come talk about this issue, say yes. We can all do those things. Thanks, Smithsonian does a lot of this, may I say. So we really ought to hear from Ellen about this one. Yeah. <laughs> I will say on our Vaccines and Us website, this, that Francis, you're, this is exactly what we were thinking of, is how do we provide resources to community centers around the country, posters they can put up? Because as you say, there are so many reasons that have been researched for why communities are, are resistant to vaccines, and the answers are different. And so are we providing all the resources we can in a really clear way so that communities around the country can pick and choose amongst those resources to really reach out. And, and it, I, I agree with you. I, when I was um, chief scientist of NASA, I would go around to the NASA centers and say, I want all of you to be giving a talk to a church group, to be giving a talk to a Girl Scout troop. This is part of your job. It is what you have to do. We have to get out there and talk about what we do because that passion, that process, then people will start to understand science a little better. Yeah, I could just add one other thing that White House has sponsored, and it's now really gotten quite a lot of momentum, uh, something called the COVID Community Core, CCC. Uh, if you're interested in looking up that, just Google under, we can do this. That's the motto. We can do this. And you'll see um, hundreds of organizations, lots of church organizations, uh, community centers, and so on have signed on to this. Uh, groups like uh, the National Urban League, trying to reach out uh, to those who have been hit particularly hard with COVID, getting all the information you could want in front of people about vaccines, about testing, uh, the COVID community core, that kind of thing coming together now in the face of an emergency. Maybe we could learn from that as something that ought to have legs even going beyond the current crisis. So uh, I'd like to jump in here too to just say, we're in the middle of this pandemic, but imagine that the disease could be transferred by people who never came into contact with each other, but that it actually went through the internet. <laughs> well, that is the kind of pandemic we're dealing with in terms of misinformation. It is has all of the same attributes mm -hmm. of uh, epidemiology, except it goes through the internet. You are not safe anywhere unless you completely unplug. So recognizing this, uh, the Academy started a partnership with Google and Bing in which we asked the internet providers to tell us what are the most important questions that people are searching for answers for on the internet, but you find that all of the potential places where those searches could be sent our misinformation. And then armed with that list of topics for which the internet is crawling with conspiracy theories and misinformation, we got together the experts and paired them with science writers to distill what might be um, really solid recommendations, but from wonky science papers and uh, academy reports and wrote them at the eighth grade level so that anyone could understand it. This, this program is called Based on Science. And during COVID, we added content which previously had been on uh, issues such as climate change and um, cancer and human health. We added a whole big section on COVID. That is now the top Google searched item for information on COVID. And it has been so popular that it has actually driven traffic to other academy sites where people are looking for more detail on good information. So um, this isn't to say that I, I think we need to also uh, reach out to uncommon uh, purveyors of information that are community-based, such as pastors and local weathermen and people like that. Uh, but, but I think something like this can be done um, effectively. I'll also say, and kudos to NIH, that your scientist, Kismekia Korbut, is probably a one-woman outreach 
to the um, African American community. And we talked earlier about how if science doesn't look like America, how can we possibly reach them? Well, she is doing that because yep. she worked on the vaccine. That is her community. She grew up in rural North Carolina and is so effective at telling her community, look, I worked on this, it is safe, and I wouldn't do something because this is something that I want my grandma and my grandpa to take this vaccine. Mm -hmm. So we have to do that as well. Thank hey, you if so I can much, just jump everyone. in and add a comment, if that's okay. Uh, yes, Hans. Okay, so you know this moment has shown us the importance of social behavioral sciences, that how important it is that the message, the trustworthiness of what we are saying as scientists and others is very, very important in terms of adherence to the kinds of things that we want people to listen to and potentially you know, uh, exercise their judgment to that. So you know, I'm very happy to say that one of the, you know, we funded many, many rapid and eager grants. And one of the grants, if I can quickly thumbnail it, uh, is a grant by uh, in our Nobel laureate, Abjit Banerjee at, at, at Harvard. And, um, and uh, basically what he did was he did a study in Calcutta where he had trusted people like Abjit Banerjee and other folks that people trust and had the messages about complying to all the protocol, safety protocols. And they had these phone messages of different kinds, you know, where wearing masks, maintaining social distance, washing hands, et cetera, of different types. And it turned out that not only did people, and it was control groups, not only did people adhere to what was said, but they adhered to all the other protocols that were not even said in the messages because they trusted the person who was communicating this message to them. And therefore they adhered to the protocols. Then the same study brought back here and said, how might we then take, you know, in the African-American community and Hispanic community, physicians of that community, then sending these messages out and therefore the adherence being increased. And so it was a very interesting study, just a $200,000 project, but came up with unbelievable, impactful messages of how messages should be communicated. So I just want to underscore, you know, oftentimes we question social behavioral sciences and the importance of that. These are simply intertwined with all the sciences. I'm not talking about amongst us as a scientific community, but I'm talking about there is this question about this sometimes outside. And I'm trying to make sure that this moment has shown us, if not you know, anything, that these are very, very important to how do you intertwine the science and technology advancements with social behavioral science as an underpinning. And that, that advancement is exceedingly important in situations like this and more. And therefore, I think at NSF, we are therefore doubling down, tripling down, quadrupling down in order to make sure that this gets the attention that it needs so that we don't have such problems in this magnitude in the future, hopefully. So thank you very much. Thank you all so much for, for joining us as science leaders and as participants in this meeting. Um, I'm committed to giving us a break from this vector uh, of, of misinformation, but also good information. Um, I, I will gavel this session to a close shortly, um, first by thanking the science leaders who have joined me. I'm so looking forward to working with all of you during this administration, and we're going to be joined by more, and we're going to have a really big group picture by the Einstein statue around this time next year. Uh, we, I'm also appreciative of everyone who's joined us and who has asked questions. Apologies for not being able to ask all of your questions. Uh, and do stay tuned, take a break, but uh, stay tuned at two o'clock for a follow-on session on, on the scientific workforce that will be led by my colleagues at OSGP, Dr. Alondra Nelson and Dr. Jane Lubchenko. Uh, but uh, wonderful to spend this Sunday, happy DNA day with you all of you. And, um, I will look forward to seeing more of you uh, and all of you who are participating in days to come. Thank you so much.